Now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Zaha Hassan. She's a human rights lawyer and a visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Zaha first became interested in human rights in high school during a year that she spent in Ramallah at the Friends School um, in 1986-87. It was at a time of heavy Israeli suppression and restriction, not to say that it's not still continuing, but, um, and but books uh, and publications were banned or heavily censored. And as she told me, she got a lot of her education that year on the street. Um, trying to find unfiltered information for a class research paper, Zaha found herself at the human rights organization Al Haq and ended up spending a lot of her time there with the staff, learning about Palestine. It was there that her passion for human rights and international law was born. After graduating from UC Berkeley with a human rights law degree, she became a consultant and advocate for Palestinian NGOs on civil rights law, spending time in Geneva. She then returned to Palestine when she was offered a position with the Palestinian Negotiation Support Unit in Ramallah, where she became the coordinator and um, senior legal advisor in the run-up to the Palestinian bid for membership after which she became a member of the Palestinian delegation to the quartet-sponsored exploratory talks between 2011 and 12. Now, as a visiting fellow at Carnegie, her research focuses on Palestine-Israel peace, the use of international legal mechanisms for political movements, and U.S. foreign policy in the region. She regularly participates in Track to Peace efforts and is a contributor to The Hill and Haaretz, her commentaries can be found uh, in the New York Times, The Salon, CNN, and Al Jazeera English, among others. Today, Zaha is going to talk to us about uh, her co-authored policy paper called Breaking the Israel-Palestine Status Quo that was released just last Wednesday, which outlines how the Biden administration can break the Middle East peace impasse by adopting a rights-based approach as the center of its strategy. Zaha, welcome. Thank you, Julia, and thank you to the Washington Report for inviting me today. It's really great uh, opportunity for me to share with you all the, um, the new policy paper that we've been working on for about uh, a year and a half. And it really involved bringing together former policymakers that work directly on the Israel-Palestine file, experts in various think tanks, advocacy or organizations that many of you all will, have, will know about um, working on Israel-Palestine peace, human rights groups and thought leaders, um, all to assess you know, what US engagement has been in the region and sort of how could we reimagine that engagement. Um, and that the recommendations are not just to the Biden administration, they're for a future administration. And that's because we recognize in the paper that you know we need to be focused on the long game here. It's we're not interested in you know working on short-term fixes or economic peace sort of uh, palliatives. Um, there is no two-state solution open for the taking at the moment. And likewise, there's no one state solution that offers equal rights for all um, that is likely to come in the next few years. However, the rights and security of Israelis and Palestinians should not be held hostage to a diplomatic process that has gone nowhere and that is indefinitely offline. So what went wrong with US engagement in the last 30 years of peacemaking? Mainly what we say in the paper is much of what has been preventing an end of occupation and a negotiated comprehensive agreement has been this warped incentive structure that the US engagement in the peace process has created. If I could queue up the first slide. Um, I want to draw attention to um, this Article 47 in the Fourth Geneva Convention. It has a really basic um, truth here um, for us uh, when thinking about occupied people and occupied territories. It says, quote, protected persons who are in occupied territory shall not be deprived in any case or in any manner whatsoever of the benefits of this humanitarian law convention by any agreement concluded between the authorities of the occupied territories and the occupying power, 
nor by any annexation by the latter of the whole or in part of the occupied territory, unquote. So basically this prohibition recognizes that you can't sign a peace agreement if your hands are shackled. That's not rocket science, that's common sense. So what has US engagement been? The idea behind US engagement for Palestinians and why Palestinians wanted the US involved was because only the US can deliver Israel. On the flip side, the Israelis wanted the US involved and wanted it to monopolize the mediator role in order to elbow out other rights respecting parties and stakeholders like the UN and the EU and to remove international law as the basis for an agreement. And so the peace process has been one in which over time, the US has suspended reference to rights and international law, international law and the parameters for peace. Israel has leveraged its participation in negotiations on the condition that the US back off of demands around freezing settlements and provide Israel with political cover in the UN and in other fora to prevent accountability for law violations. And the US relationship with Palestinians has been conditioned on no accessing mechanisms to reinforce the two-state solution through, for example, obtaining full UN membership no democratic government governance if that means allowing parties who oppose the Oslo peace process and, rec and uh, you know, recognition of Israel to be included in a Palestinian government and no accessing mechanisms for accountability like at the International Criminal Court. Uh, if you could cue the next slide. So the result has been predictable given what I've just said. Settlements expand and they quadruple over the years of US engagement. And you see, you know, from 1978, we have like 7,800 settlers. Then we get to, you know, engaging in the peace process. We started 116,000 um, settlers. This is just in the West Bank, by the way, these numbers. By the time we get to 2019, we have 441,000, more than 441,000 settlers in the West Bank, excluding East Jerusalem. Um, so while settlements are expanding, what's going on with, with the US um, in terms of accountability for um, Israel? So let's queue up the next slide. So you see that while settlements are expanding during the Oslo period for, from 1993 um, on, the US is overusing its veto power at the UN Security Council and is preventing all but one resolution condemning Israeli land confiscations and settlement construction from passing. Thus, the US becomes complicit in Israeli impunity and starts to look a whole lot like China and Russia in the use of its veto power. But that is only one part of the story. Now, Congress has had a role to play in how warped the US engagement has been on Israel-Palestine peacemaking. Um, if you could queue up the timeline, please. The timeline takes a little bit of time because we're going onto the internet to get that from the Carnegie website, where we've got a lot of resources, by the way, um, beyond just the policy paper posted, so I hope that you all will um, take a look at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace website um, and check out the resources we have there. Is the, is the timeline, okay, here we go. Here we go, the timeline. Uh, just one moment while like, we get into it. Oh, it's, I don't know if people are gonna be able to read it. But so every, what I wanted to show with this timeline that you can find on the website is that every step, you can stop right there to, at 19, um, 1983. So in 1983, what you see is that um, every step of the way from the start to the start of the US PLO relationship in 1983 to when President Trump um, evicted the PLO from Washington in 2018, Congress has sought to tie the hands of the administration and put obstacles around Palestinian agency, undermining um, the PLO's ability to negotiate. So in 1983, when secret talks are just starting between Reagan officials and the PLO, Congress is there to stop it by codifying a prohibition on contacts with the PLO. And then in 1987, if you scroll down a bit, when the first intifada starts, which is largely a nonviolent um, uh, uprising, Congress is there to label the representative body of the PLO 
uh, the representative of the Palestinians, the PLO, a terrorist organization. And then if you scroll down to 1990, when there is talk of Palestine becoming a member state of the UN, Congress is there back on the job to pass a law to cut funds to the UN, should it extend membership status uh, to, the PL, uh, to Palestine. And then in 1995, when we're in the middle of final status talks uh, that are going on under the Oslo uh, framework, Congress decides to legislate that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and the U.S. Embassy must move there by 1999, which is the date when the Oslo talks are scheduled to produce a comprehensive agreement. So you get the picture, what's going on here, right? We end up with U.S. engagement producing over this time um, really skewed results. If you can um, cue up the next slide of the map, please. Here we go, we'll, we'll wait for it to, to go to the beginning. So this was the promise of Oslo, the West Bank and Gaza with a, with a territorial link. And then we get to 2000, the, project, the Clinton proposal, the Clinton parameters, and then we get to 2020 and you see what happens. We get this you know, Frankenstein monster of a, of a territorial map. But that's, not, that's just on territory, how US um, U.S. engagement has sort of warped the, the land area that was promised for a Palestinian state. The next slide, we see how under Trump in particular, how the U.S. position on refugees, you know, takes a turn um, and the U.S. starts to leverage its assistance to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, to to cut funding uh, where the US had traditionally provided a third of UNRWA's budget, the Trump administration cut it off completely so that the, the organization was strapped and in trouble, and it still is in trouble. Despite the fact that the Biden administration has resumed some aid to UNRWA, it's only resumed a, you know, a fraction, maybe a third of what it used to be. Um, still leaving in question whether or not this is going to be like a wind down of UNRWA or whether it's going to be just a step towards rebuilding the, the level of aid UNRWA used to receive, which is critical to providing, you know, hundreds of thousands of um, children with education, with health care, including primary health care for um, COVID um, prevention and vaccinations and um, you know, micro lending and so many other things that UNRWA provides, including jobs. It's, a, it's an important job um, provider, not just in the occupied Palestinian territories, but for Palestinians in the neighboring host countries. And um, you know, it's unclear, like I said, whether or not the Biden administration is going to hold firm on, in support of UNRWA and encourage other states, which you see that there's decline in, the, in how much other states are providing as well, support to UNRWA, um, because there's so much pressure today to um, shut UNRWA down. In fact, there's a letter sent um, by members of the Senate, I think 13 members of the Senate to the Secretary of State saying that they, they want um, you know, aid to UNRWA conditioned and, and stopped because they believe that the numbers reflecting the descendants of refugees um, are, are um, um, you know, keeping the refugee issue alive rather than the fact that Israel refuses to allow Palestinians the right to return. Um, so fast forward to today and there is no two state solution open for the taking and likewise a one state solution that offers equal rights is just as unlikely and precisely at this moment. When Israel is entrenching apartheid, the US says it is deprioritizing its engagement because it has more other more important domestic and foreign policy concerns to attend to. Essentially, the authors of the Carnegie US MEP paper say that to do so after 30 years of US engagement that got us to where we are today, and while Palestinians are weaker than they have ever been in the region with the normalization ongoing between Israel and the Arab states, which this administration incidentally wholeheartedly supports, even while those agreements are undermining Israeli-Palestinian peace and international law, this is disingenuous. 
The rights and security of Israelis and Palestinians should not be held hostage to, it, to this um, diplomatic process that is going nowhere. The paper, in line with what we heard in our consultations with experts in the US and in Israel and um, Palestine, identifies four principles for reimagining US engagement between Palestinians and Israelis. First, and most important in my view, is centering rights and human security. Second, is rolling back Trump administration actions and its peace to prosperity plan in its entirety. No cherry picking and reaffirm the importance of international law and peacemaking. Third is clarify the expectations that the administration has for Israelis as well as Palestinians and back those up with the levers of US policy. And fourth, work collaboratively with multilateral mechanisms and the UN so that the rules-based international order is strengthened rather than undermined by US engagement on a durable solution for Israelis and Palestinians. Contrary to what many policymakers think, a group Philip Weiss refers to as the blob, this actually does not involve more US involvement. Rather, it requires less but smarter engagement. If the US continues the policy of shielding Israel from accountability for its conduct, particularly now as more and more legal experts and human rights organizations are describing Israel's system of domination over Palestinians as apartheid, the US will have to expend more and more of its time, resources and political capital defending Israel. This will undermine US interests in the region where the Palestinian cause is still a principal concern of Arab constituencies. And it will undermine the US as it seeks to regain its stature as a global leader. A rights respecting approach also happens to align with President Joe Biden's overall US national security strategy, which mentions values around 23 times in the 20 pages of the body of the text. But centering rights also involves centering the rights Israeli and Palestinian leaders owe to their peoples. The warped incentive structure that I talked about, that has been created over the years to maintain negotiations, also impacts Israeli governance and empowers the ultranationalists who seek um, to, you know, to prevent any kind of compromise position. This has produced trend lines in Israel in the direction of greater authoritarianism and denial of equal protection and the mainstreaming of parties that are advocating for Jewish supremacy from the river to the sea. In the occupied territories, the PA and PLO relationship to their people has also been negatively impacted in an attempt to conform to the image of a good peace partner to the US. The Palestinian leadership has prioritized the peace process over strengthening national institutions and democratic governance. The fracturing of the Palestinian rule from Gaza and the West Bank has been supported in US policy and sustained by restrictions on economic assistance rather than remedied by US facilitating reconciliation that might actually moderate Hamas's conduct. The PA has also played to US and international donors in the conduct of its state building project that depends on Israeli approvals and which de-emphasizes sustainable development that might keep Palestinian families on their land. So over time, the ruling party sacrificed nascent Palestinian democracy and closed political space for op oppositional factions and civil society. So of course, centering rights does not get you a peace agreement tomorrow. We aren't so naive to, as to think that, whether that's a one state solution or a two state solution. But what it does do is it changes the political calculations of the parties so that over time they are encouraged to recalibrate their actions vis-a-vis -vis each other and vis-a-vis -vis their own constituencies. And this produces a better chance of creating the environment we need for conducive, meaningful negotiations toward a durable solution. So the authors of the policy paper think that the Biden administration is gonna take this up and, and run with it, right? No, of course not. <laughs> Our theory of change from the start of this project was to engage with civil society actors and to empower them with policy recommendations uh, and an approach that they could then push with their, you know, their elected leaders and with this administration. And so that's what my participation in this event is for, is really to share this with you and to hope that you'll, you know, learn more about it, go to our website and, and read the policy paper and, um, and then, you know, work within your own communities where you are to try to 
you know, see the change that we all think needs to happen for U.S. policy to be, um, you know, a, a positive player in all of this. And so I'll stop there. Thank you. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm really curious, uh, Zaha, you, you just rolled out the paper this week um, outlining the, the rights-based approach, which, as you said, can be used for any one of the myriad of, of suggestions that have been made recently for the one state, two state, um, even confederation. Um, but aren't you, are you, what has been the reaction um, to, to the paper thus far? Has it, have you gotten any yet? You know, I mean, it's hard in this COVID world to <laughs> to really, um, you know, interact with people and, and sort of see reactions like of an audience or what have you. But I mean, the the I'm I've been pleasantly surprised in that you know, in terms of social media and um, you know, messages that I've been getting from email from folks, um, it's been really uh, overwhelmingly positive and people are saying, you know, this has been a long time coming and they're shocked that it's come from Carnegie, a sort of, you know, mainstream DC think tank rather than, you know, just sort of a left wing um, progressive uh, leaning think tank in DC. I mean, as Philip Weiss said, you know, we are part of the blob, Carnegie's part of the blob, but um, you know, there's an independence of thinking at Carnegie that allows for sort of this honest assessment that we have all been craving. Um, I think all of the speakers, you know, left, you know, their remarks at the end with this kind of sense of like, you know, we need change. And we hear that, you know, inside of Carnegie talking to folks that we engage with. We, we, we heard that in all of our meetings um, across the board in Israel, Palestine, and, um, and, and, you know, even among the former policymakers that were engaged with us in consultation for this project um, to, to produce this paper, you know, they will tell you behind closed doors and off the record that they know that this is the only way to change the situation um, and the calculations that Israelis have, that Palestinian leaders have with respect to how they um, engage with their people and, and, and their, their governance, that this is the only way to do it. It makes sense. It's what we do. We, we use the levers of power um, in the US in every other context. We don't just hand out billions of dollars of aid to a country and expect nothing in return. We, you know, we always um, have strings attached, and that's part of, you know, our diplomatic power that we have. And um, to not use it in this case where we've invested 30 years of engagement, and and we've gotten now to the point where we can say with um, complete certainty across the board for all those who've looked into it that we are now in an apartheid situation. To say now that the U.S. has nothing it can do is really um, is really disingenuous, as I said earlier. And so um, the I, the response has been very, very good. Now there are those <laughs> who have have um, written um, critically about the paper, let's say. And I think um, for those folks that are um, having trouble with this idea of a rights based approach. Um, it comes from a place of, you know, having invested so much time in this, this construct of a peace process and having, you know, built careers around um, supporting this peace process. Um, it's very difficult to let that go because in some sense, it's, it's a failure, you know. Um, and there's also some, some sense of feeling uh, like blame because of where we ended, where we landed during, you know, after all those decades, right? So that, I think, I think that's where the criticism is sitting, but I don't think anyone really questions the fact that there's something terribly wrong with the way the U.S. is approaching this. And we're not seeing any change actually when it comes to the Biden administration to the extent that, that they're willing to restart aid, you know, some aid, not all aid, because there's still the, that congressional you know, restrictions in place that, that the administration is not going to be able to, to, or doesn't have the political will or capital to, to reverse or repeal. 
but um, there's, you know, there's only so much it's willing to do right now because of other priorities and, um, and you know, it's just not, um, it's not, so the, the most it will do is provide some, you know, more assistance, give some assistance to uh, uh, multilateral mechanisms like UNRWA, but for it to, to actually um, condition aid, it said absolutely not, it won't condition aid to Israel, that's completely off limits. It's continuing in the uh, UN to provide political cover to Israel. And it's, it's said it, it's, it's explicitly, the Biden administration's explicitly rejoining UN uh, bodies because it wants to be, be there to be able to protect Israel. So we're seeing like a continuation of these really tr you know, troubling um, policies that got us here in the first place. <laughs> so this is, you know, this is the challenge that we have. So in essence, through the work of this paper and this policy and the recommendations for a rights-based approach, are you calling for the U.S. to abide by international law and their own federal law in dealing with the state of Israel? That's the idea, right? I mean, and the, and the beautiful thing is, is that's exactly what the Biden administration says that they want to do. I mean, after having four years of a Trump administration that was purely transactional, and it was all about what can I get from this country or that country and law be damned, this administration has said it wants a reset. And it wants a reset so that it can rebuild its relationships and alliances with law respecting democratic countries and it wants to um you know rebuild itself as a global leader and to do that it's it wants to focus on values it wants to put values at the center of its foreign policy and it wants its values that it projects abroad to be in line with the values that we hold dear in the U in the united states and in this moment of racial reckoning when we are, you know, um, trying to reimagine what America should look like after 400 years of, you know, racial discrimination and, and oppression in our own country, to think that we could now maintain a policy with Israel that sees no daylight um, at a time when Israel is um, perpetrating uh, an apartheid uh, system over Palestinians is really difficult to, to um, square with, with the idea of a foreign policy that's centering values. And this is at a time also when we've hired the first um, chief of diversity inclusion within the State Department to remedy the way the State Department operates from this hiring to its own policies, right? And this is an African-American woman. So are we, are we going to continue with this this contradiction in the way we, you know, we assert our values, but then completely uh, disregard them as we conduct our foreign policy. And again, I'm not so naive to think that this administration is going to see that hypocrisy, right? It's something that we have to point out. And we have to point out to our elected officials, we have to point out to the administration in order for, for you know, we could, for us to call those things out. The Palestine exception. Yes. We need to <laughs> um, end it. <laughs> we need to end it. Um, Dale, are there any questions you have um, from the audience coming in? Yeah. Uh, you, she kind of talked about it, but I guess to name names of the critics here, one of them was Aaron David Miller, who I, I think you were talking about without naming him. Uh, maybe I can just get your response to two of his specific criticisms in this sort of response to your report. Uh, where he kind of said that you guys are giving a pass to Palestinian obligations, not giving them enough responsibilities, and you're kind of ignoring their so-called history of rejectionism. Just your thoughts on that uh, feedback that was yeah. also posted on the Carnegie website. Yeah, so I, I, first I want to say that, you know, Aaron David Miller is a colleague and um, someone that I've, I've written with. Um, Carnegie has a big tent. And we have a lot of different perspectives. And like I said, a lot of uh, folks, um, you know, from the policymaking space, former government officials that have been invested in, in the two-state solution and in the Oslo peace process and in working with Palestinians and Israelis, this is a very difficult subject. This, 
you know, for all the reasons that I said earlier. So, um, you know, I take, I take um, Aaron David Miller's criticism, but I respectfully say <laughs> that I disagree. I disagree as a human rights lawyer that rights have no place in this conflict, that we need to exceptionalize Israel-Palestine. I take exception as a Palestinian who's lived under occupation that somehow I don't deserve rights or my, you know, I living in the occupied terrorists, I didn't deserve rights because it was complicating um, negotiations. I reject that. I don't, I don't accept exceptions um, in any case. You know, human beings all deserve rights, regardless of whether or not it's uncomfortable um, for some <laughs> to think about, um, you know, moving away from a paradigm that, um, that people have invested so much time in. Now, with respect to his criticism about um, giving a pass to Palestinians, we do not give a pass to Palestinians. I mean, you, you know, folks read the paper. We talk about, you know, the lack of, um, you know, good governance for, from Palestinians. We talk about, um, you know, the lack of accountability, the, the, um, auto, the autocratic rule that has um, festered over the course of the peace process. And, and we're extremely critical and we have, um, you know, we, we call that out. But at the same time, we're not dealing with two equal sides here. As someone earlier mentioned, you know, this whole idea of like this conflict, this is not a conflict at this point. We're talking about a people living under occupation and that occupation having morphed into a system of domination from the river to the sea. That's, you know, fits the legal des uh, description of apartheid. So we aren't, we aren't treating Israelis and Palestinians equally in this paper because they aren't equals. So we will call out the Palestinian side, the Palestinian leadership for, for their failures and their lack of um, uh, good governance and legitimacy among their own people, their failure to hold elections. We will call all of that out and we, and we talk about all of that in the paper, but will we, will we try to equate the, those two sides? No, because that's, they're not equal. That's the whole nature of occupation. Great, thanks uh, for that answer. Uh, just one more question here. Uh, say, you know, in, in a hypothetical fantasy world, the U.S. were to adopt a rights-based approach. You know, some have suggested that it's really U.S. support that is propping up Israel and that if U.S. support stopped, so much of its policies would have to change. You know, as Phil noted, though, the Knesset is very right-leaning these days. Do you really, do you think that, you know, were this approach to be adopted by Washington, you know, how would that look in Israel? Would it really force them to change or would they kind of dig deep and try and make it work with their current system? I know well, it's hypothetical, but- Yeah, just, no, it's, it's yeah. a good question. I, people are kind of worried about it right now, honestly. It's not, a, um, it's not so hypothetical. I mean, there was an article in Haaretz uh, a few days ago by some is former Israeli security folks. And they're really concerned about how the Israelis are approaching the US when it comes to Iran. And they're telling, basically this article is written to the Israeli leadership saying, don't count on having a great relationship with the US forever and continue to try to thwart the US on you know, trying to, to uh, put the Iran nuclear deal back online. So, Israeli, there's, you know, is Israeli officials, former officials are recognizing that the gravy train might, might end at some point. So let us not, let us not be so um, blind to the fact that, that this administration and in the future administrations, they may, there, there may not be this love, you know, and this unconditional love <laughs> um, lasting forever. And we are seeing now this, you know, this movement and it's still very much only in the progressive side, but you know it's growing. The people that are talking about accountability, like the Betty McCollum bill, talking about prohibiting the use of US security assistance in the commission of human rights abuses. Like how basic is that? She's not even saying let's condition aid. She's just saying, we're gonna give you aid. We expect you not to use it in certain ways. Um, so can we put the mechanisms in place so we can have oversight, monitoring, and transparency when it comes to the use of, you know, U.S. security assistance? So we're, you, we're seeing steps in the right direction from policymakers, and it's still very early, and it still needs time to, 
grow. And this policy paper is part of that effort to expand that discourse and to open up space within policy making circles because really there's been a disconnect between where the electorate is and where policymakers are because Americans in general are saying they favor and they said they say this year after year they favor by a big majority two-thirds a, a neutral U.S. policy when it comes to Israel-Palestine and they and within Democrats now this year, we have a majority saying that they would like to see more pressure on Israel. 53% in a Gallup poll said they want to see more pressure on Israel to make peace. So that's these are the trend lines. Now, the policymakers haven't gotten there yet, but that's why civil society's got to be a lot louder, a lot more organized, and, and we're getting there. And Palestine is no longer a fringe issue that, you know, that the progressives don't want to have to touch because they, they don't they're worried about how it might affect everything else people are recognizing that palestine is part of the package deal part of the values that you know democrats care about you know and if you if you want to talk about a value centered foreign policy then how you talk about palestine matters so so i don't think it's as far off as all of that i think it's coming and we just need to give it a good, healthy push. At the same time, you, you saw during the election cycle, um, you know, uh, the now sitting Senator Warak um, from Georgia and Jamal Bowman, who originally were, were talking about, you know, Palis Palestinian and Palestine rights, um, take steps back from that. Um, you know, and, and all of a sudden there, we see them at J Street and at the conservative conference and, and perhaps in the future at APAC. Um, what do, how do you educate members of Congress that, that this approach might be best for the United States? Well, that's what we're doing with this paper. I mean, you know, we aren't this, you know, our theory of change in this paper is not, is not for us to just produce a paper, make a splash and then go home. You know, the idea is we, we hit we hit the hill, <laughs> we hit the administration, and we continue to talk it up with people in meetings and um, in a, different ways of engaging with them. And that's what we're doing next week. You know, we've already started doing that. Um, but really, ultimately, it's not it's not for Carnegie and USMEP to um, to be pushing this paper out. It's really for us to be engaging with civil society about about the paper and then having civil society go and work on it. And we've started having those meetings too, you know, with different stakeholders, people that have um, organizations that were really part of the whole process. Because we had, you know, part of um, our work was meeting with civil society organizations in the U.S. and um, organizations abroad in Palestine, Israel, to talk about what made sense. Because we recognize that, you know, rarely do um, you know, the marginalized get to make, um, get to have a say in what policy should look like coming from the U.S., right? They're, they're the ones impacted the most, but they never get a chance to sit at a table and discuss it, discuss how it impacts them and, and how it needs to change so, so that they can have a chance at a, at a dignified life, at a rights-respecting life. So, so we engaged folks from the start and, and the idea is to make people invested in, in the very tangible asks that we have in the paper. Because I mean, I've given you today the overarching principles, but we actually have very tangible things that this administration can do today if they so chose and if there was a big push um, from folks on, you know, in civil society, uh, you know, telling them so. But, and and we, we've seen some of the things that we included in our paper already kind of happening. So these aren't pie in the sky, you know, recommendations. There are recommendations that are actually quite doable. Um, and it's just gonna take, um, a, you know, advocacy effort by, um, by different organizations in the US, human rights organizations, faith groups, um, you know, um, groups and within Palestinian community, within the Jewish American community, all taking it up. You know, what we tried to do was to give sort of a frame, a framing, because what we what we see in, when we talk about Israel-Palestine is the framing is completely off. Again, we're talking about both sides. We're talking about conflict. We're talking about, you know, 
um, as though e each side has equal claims here. That's not the case. You know, we're dealing with um, you know systemic discrimination, and we're dealing with um, you know an occupation, and so the 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 whole framing that we have has to change. And so that's part of the, the process of re-educating policymakers is trying to get, get the facts straight so that they can make the policies straight. Are there any more questions? Yeah. I'm sure there are tons no, of I questions. Think we're <laughs> Someone just wants to know where they could find the report. I'll make sure we'll link to it on our YouTube page so we can get a link to the Carnegie website yeah. and check it out. Do you guys have like a chat function or no? Where you can drop it? Yeah, I put, I put it in the Q&A. Um, oh, okay, great. We'll, anyway, yeah, please, and, yeah, when we regurgitate please we'll, uh, we'll do share. download the file, download it, print it, take, you know, <laughs> take it to your um, member of Congress and really, um, you know, and sit sit with sit with your civil society organizations and talk about it, and talk about what what parts of it um, are doable for you. What parts of it might you be able to have a conversation with your members uh, about? And if you know, and if you want us to talk to your civil society organization, we're happy to do that too. I mean, that's that's part of what we um, you know we plan to do with this um, with this paper. And I think it's especially important now, as we see, you know, that the that the, the Pal Palestine is is disappearing um, from the agenda, from and from the map, um, you know, as things are being are changing on the ground every day. Um, and we heard some of that from our previous speakers too. And so I thank you very much for for suggesting an alternative framework for how we advocate and discuss. Um, the Palestinian Israeli um, issue. <laughs> we need to figure out a new word because yes. because all of us have been trained to uh -huh. to say it that way, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, we need so to that's... come up with a new vocabulary. Yeah, yeah we do. We do. Yeah. Because as we've heard today, it's really important how you talk about things mm -hmm. and how you name things. So I thank you very much, uh, Zaha, for your time today and for sharing your your wisdom and your work. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thanks for having me. Good luck with the rest of the, uh, is this the last day or no? Well, it's the last day for this one, but we have a lot of other things planned for the future with extras <laughs> and, and different uh, speakers. So we may have you back to talk a little bit more about, uh, about your policy paper and how it's going. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. Take care. Thank you.